there'll be something going on for everybody that night. Ba nursery, kids on the move, Ignite Soul Fire is going to be a fantastic, fantastic way to start your month. Amen? Let me just get right into the what I believe God wants me to share with you before we go our separate ways this afternoon and get back here tonight. And that is this thought that has been on my mind uh, when God likes to lose. When God likes to lose. How many of you don't mind losing? Okay. How many of you hate to lose? <laughs> A competitive bunch. And so those of you, when I make that statement, it probably jars you to think that God would enjoy losing. But there are several episodes throughout the Scripture that we find that there are times that God likes to lose. Here are just a, a couple. How about Jacob? Not Jacob Bean, but I mean Jacob in the Bible. He had been a very shifty, conniving self-serving guy. I mean, he had great agendas, but small conscience. If you ever got involved in a business deal with Jacob, you wanted to have at least three lawyers to read over the fine print in the document. I mean, he was a, he was the, he was a, a, a greasy, he, you could just see him like got a card up his sleeve. He's got a plan in the back of his mind that when this deal's done, you're going to lose and he's going to win big. And he's going to make you feel good about it. And the Bible says that he was running for his life because his character was not what it needed to be. His poor character was jeopardizing his life. And the Bible says one night that he got into a wrestling match with God. Now, I don't know what that looks like, but I have a strong feeling that God was the favored winner in that battle. I don't know if it was... When I was a kid, we used to... We used to do pinochle wrestling. How many have ever done that? You grab a guy's hands and you, and you twist until the other guy says uncle. And, and I don't know, but somehow some kind of encounter came between Jacob and God. And Jacob said, I want you to bless me and I want you to change me. And God said, I don't want to do it. You don't wrestle with somebody who's got the same desire that you have. You wrestle somebody who has an opposite desire than you have. But the Bible says that as day began to break, God said, All right, Jacob, this time I'm okay with losing. You win. And God says, I'll change your character. I'll change your destiny. I'll change your situation. Tonight, today I want to tell somebody here today that no matter what you're going through in, with your past, that God wants to lose because your destiny is a poor one, but God wants to change your destiny and give you a good one by changing who you are. God lost when Abraham was praying over a city. You see, he had brought his nephew Lot on this long journey, and Lot, when he found Abraham, was broke. But the longer Lot's hung around his uncle, the more prosperous Lot became. But like what happens to many people, when Lot got prosperous, he forgot who helped him in his time of need. Come on, shake your head like this if you know it's tell I'm telling the truth. And when Abraham's business and Lot's business began to get so big and so much power that the businesses began to fight, Abraham said to Lot, look, there are two places for you to go. You can either stay here in this barren, dry land, or you can go down in that valley where there's all kinds of greenery and there's life. And Lot left his uncle in the dry place and went to the living place. That place was called Sodom and Gomorrah. And God told Abraham, I'm going to destroy that city. Now, a lot of people think that God was only going to destroy the city because of immorality or, or perverted sexual uh, activity. But the Bible states very clearly that was only one of the sins that were being committed. There were a lot of things going on in that city that made God say, I'm going to destroy this city because it's destroying people. When Abraham found that out, he said to God, I know what you want to do, but would you spare the city for 50 people? And God's like, sure, I know the people. There's not 50 there. How about 40? How about 30? How about 20? And God's like, no problem. No problem. There aren't that many people there. I've already counted how many righteous people are in Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham puts him up against the wall and he says, how about 10? And God says, all right, Abraham, you win. I lose. 
I'll spare judgment until those people can leave. God, at times, likes to lose. How about Hezekiah? He was the king over Israel, a righteous king. But for one reason or another, Isaiah was told by God to tell Hezekiah, you're going to die. God said, the king will die. And so when Isaiah sent that message to Hezekiah, who, had actually, who actually had been sick, the Bible says he's laying in his bed, and he turns over and looks at the wall. Many writers have wondered, what did he say? I think he said, hello, wall. <laughs> I heard one person say, when Hezekiah looked at the wall, all he could see was God. Sometimes when you're facing a situation that to everybody else is inevitable and it seems like it can't change. How many have ever been in a dark moment that you couldn't see anything and then all of a sudden all you could see was God? Mark and Doris, Levi and Brooke, they were in a moment. Cassie, they were in a moment that all they could see was darkness. But in the midst of their darkness, all they could see was God. Come on, somebody. And when Hezekiah looked over at that wall, he cried, God, I know you said that I'm not going to live, but I want more time. And God said, okay, you win. I'll give you 15 more years. Are you getting the point? There are times that God wants to lose. We celebrate a season that God lost. The Bible says in the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verse 6, that though Jesus was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Verse 7. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges... He took the humble position of a slave, and he was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. Verse 8. He humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Stop right there. Jesus Christ, as I've told you before, did not begin his life 2,000 years ago. His life was in existence long before time began. John chapter 1 states very clearly that Jesus, there is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and Jesus has always been in existence. Always been in existence. Where he lived, the streets were made of gold. Walls were made of jasper. The foundation made of rubies. Walls 1,400 miles long. The gates, not made of pearls, but the gates were made of one pearl. Do you hear that, honey? One pearl per gate. I'm telling you, it was a marvelous place that he lived. The sea was crystal. The Bible lets us know that Jesus is ageless, dateless, deathless, endless, everlasting, immortal, unchanging. He has always been, he is, and he always will be. He's not baby Jesus. I know they said it in the movie, but he's not baby Jesus. He's not old man Jesus. He's not Saint Nick Jesus. He's Jesus, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and he always will be. And he's in this meeting today. Hallelujah. He's all God. When Jesus came into humanity, he didn't give up some of his godness. He gave up some of his privileges, but he didn't give up his godness. I think we got to get this doctrine right because there's a lot of false teaching in Christmas churches, in Christian churches, and it revolves around the life of Jesus. But I'm telling you, when Jesus was born, he was 100% God and 100% human. We want to lessen his humanity because if Jesus was 100% human, then if he had victory in the flesh, we should have victory in the flesh. <coughs> but we want to remove that out of the gospel so we have an excuse to sin. Well, Jesus didn't say, yeah, but he wasn't all man. No, he was all man. But he was all God. He was born to a woman, had brothers and sisters. He was Jewish. He grew up physically, spiritually, mentally, socially. He learned. He experienced fatigue. He slept. He got hungry. He was thirsty. He rooted for the Steelers. <laughs> he had a job. He had friends. He was an encourager. He loved children. He celebrated holidays. He went to parties. He loved his mom. He prayed. He worshipped. 
He obeyed the Heavenly Father. He suffered and he died. He experienced loss. He experienced hunger. He experienced rejection, pain, racism, anguish, attacks, and an untimely to man's perspective, death. But I'm here to tell you today that that God forfeited the singing angels, forfeited a, a, a place without hospitals, a place without funeral homes, a place without sickness, a place without lawyers. He left it all, the praises of the angels, the glories of heaven, to come and experience the depravity of the life that we don't know any different of. That's the incarnation. And I'm going to tell you, friend, there was no gain for him in that existence. It was in that moment that God realized if he did not provide a human sacrifice, that the justice that, de his, that God demanded would never allow mankind to have a relationship with God. And so God, because he loves us too much to leave us where we're at, came and put himself into a human body and suffered and died so that the justice and the punishment that Matt Ward and you deserve does not have to happen because Jesus already took the punishment for all of us. You say, why does God send somebody to hell? He sends nobody to hell. You send yourself. He's done everything he can to get you to heaven. That includes leaving heaven and coming to the earth. And you know the story, I think. But in case you don't, the Bible says that he was brutally beaten. His back whipped so many times that it ripped open so much that the writers say you could actually see his intestines. They beat his face. I can't imagine how many bones in his face were destroyed. They put a crown of thorns and pounded them into the skull of his head. They nailed, put nails through the ulnar nerves of his wrist and ankles and nailed him to the cross and suspended him naked while the crowd spit on him and ridiculed him. I'm going to tell you, friend, it was a brutal slaying. That tells me that God hates sin a lot and he loves you even more. If Jesus went to the cross and took that kind of beating and you think you're going to go to heaven because you're good, you're delusional. The cross proves that good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. <clears throat> he was buried and he rose again. Listen to these scriptures because they're important. They're still eternally timeless. 1 Timothy 3 verse 16. Without question... This is the great mystery of our faith, that Christ, this is the mystery of our faith, that Christ was revealed in a human body, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, announced by the nations, and was believed in throughout the world and taken to heaven in glory. Look at what this verse says in the book of uh, uh, Galatians, I think, is next. When the right time came, God sent His Son, born of a woman, subject to the law. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. I'm telling you today, when, 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 uh, when Brandon Washburn, who first heard the gospel in that season of his life through the online ministry, began to share it with his family. The reason Brandon Washburn is in heaven today is not because the devil gave up on Brandon. It's because Jesus began to overcome the power that the devil has through death on all of humanity. And if you want to know what God looks like, look at Jesus. Jesus is the replica of divine reality the beauty of God's holiness, the repository of God's fountain, the ocean of God's fullness, the authority of God's throne, the legacy of God's will, the majesty of God's power, the reality of God's presence, the pity of God's heart, and the power of God's hand. The Bible goes on to say in Philippians chapter 2, where we started, verse 9, Therefore, God elevated him in the place of highest honor, and gave him a name above every name. Verse 10. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven. Come on, somebody. How about, how about in church? I'd like to see some praise him in church. On earth and under heaven. Verse 11. Watch this. And every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 
That's Jesus. Worthy of praise. Worthy of honor. Here's what confounds me today. When God lost, He lost, and every time He loses, it's so that you and I can win. Let's talk about the incarnation and the resurrection, and I'm done. They're bookends. Because of his resurrection, I praise him. But because of his incarnation, I serve him. The resurrection is where Jesus faced death. And death stood between God and mankind. And hell said you to God, you have to die. Watch this. And God's response, no. No, I'm God. You all get that? Like all of you look pretty powerful today, but none of you are powerful enough to overcome death. Imagine if, if Jared came up to me and said, I want all your money, and he took out a rubber band and threatened me with it. <laughs> Give me all your money or I'm going to smack you with this rubber band. I'm like, no. And that's all hell could do to Jesus. When hell gave its assignment for Jesus to die, it was nothing but a rubber band threat. And Jesus said, no. No, I'm not going to die. What are you, idiot? I'm God. And he overcame death and he resurrected from the grave. How many of you just understand, that's not a mystery to me, why God overcame death. I, I mean, that to me, to me, that's God just kind of flexing his muscles. Like, death? Pfft, who are you? So to be honest with you, the resurrection does not amaze me as much as the incarnation. I praise him because he overcame death. But imagine at the incarnation, what separated God from mankind is justice. Justice said, mankind never deserves you. The only way that you can have mankind is you have to become one of them. And God says, okay. Y'all good? Oh, good? Is everybody good? Are you getting this? I get why God said, I'm kicking death out of the way. Because that was his advantage. When God overcame death, that was the why he came. But when he came into the earth to be born, that's the who that he, be, he is. I praise him because he overcame death. But I serve him because he came into a manger. Sorry, it didn't mean to make you think at Christmas. But if I was God overcoming death, not even a problem. But if I was God and I had to feel anguish and hatred and die for people who turn their back on him when he doesn't do exactly what they want, I'd say forget it. I'll stay up here in heaven. If I'm God and I know that certain people are going to turn their back on me and get backslidden and lukewarm and they'll become greenhouse Christians, they only serve me when I do what they want, then I'd say, no, thank you. I'll stay up here in heaven and let the angels sing to me. But to think that God knows all of my weaknesses and all of your weaknesses and entered into humanity so that we would not be afraid of him, but that we would love him, that tells me that he's not just the God of power. He's the God of love. He's the God of mercy. He's the God of another chance. And if you think you're too far from God, you don't know the character of God. 
Isn't he a wonderful Jesus? Come on, give him praise. Give him glory. Praise God. Come on, I'm done preaching. Now I'm just going to tell you, I am flabbergasted that God would go from so high and journey so low so that he could touch the heart of Matt Ward. Yeah, let, let's rejoice for the resurrection, but there'd be no resurrection if there was no incarnation. Now why, how does that apply to us? Come on, musicians. Um, the reason, th this is where we bust religion wide open. Well, that is Western religion. This is where it busts wide open. The incarnation of Christ means that he's not interested in getting added to your life. Okay. So, uh, years ago, <clears throat> well, 25 years ago, my wife and I got married, and our lives were relatively simple. We, we, had, we had, the only concern of our lives really was to make sure we had food to eat, clothes to wear, shoes. Vehicles, transportation, heat, lights. We could pretty much get up and go whenever we wanted. We could come back whenever we wanted. Curfews were gone. I mean, we, we, we just had, we had, we had what we got married for. It was, just a, it was just a good life. And then we got to the point where we said, you know, we'd like to add to our family. This is all we want to do. We want to keep our life and we want to add a human being to it. So how many years ago? How old is Mariah? She's 20-something? She could be 21, she could be 22. And so, <laughs> sorry, that's embarrassing. Now we're both in trouble. It's usually just me. Now it's you and me together. I know. And we thought, let's add a life to our life. And when Mariah was born, it was awesome. But I can assure you, we did not add Mariah's life to our life. Our lives changed. Our lives had a whole new experience come on parents I see all these parents are going <laughs> say nothing about a second child and a third child and for Michael and Joanne a fourth child and a fifth child and a sixth child I wouldn't trade it for a half a million dollars I'm just kidding. I wouldn't trade it for a million dollars. But we were so naive. Now, maybe she wasn't, but I was. But I was so naive. I thought, we will have the same life. We'll just add a life to ours. But we didn't just add a life to ours. Our whole life changed. And I think the reason people are disappointed with Jesus is they add Jesus to their life and their life never changes. I've come to tell you, Jesus didn't come to get added to your life. He's come to give you a brand new life. Isn't that awesome? Come on, isn't that awesome? He didn't come to give you a Sunday habit. He came to change your life. That's the incarnation. When he came 2,000 years ago, he came into Mary's womb and then he took on a body. Today, he wants to incarnate inside of you. I don't think I've yet fully experienced all the fullness of Jesus' life inside of me. And neither of you. But I've committed myself to this. I'm not going to make my aim to be more like Jesus. I'm going to make my aim to have more of Jesus live inside of me. And I know that's kind of semantics. And I don't, I'm not trying to be more. I'm just saying, if Jesus could give life to a body, 
on this earth, I want him to give life to mine as well. How many of you would testify when Jesus came? He just didn't get added to your schedule. He gave you a whole new life. My life will never be the same. And when you allow him to come into yours, you will never be the same either. I think we ought to say thank you, Jesus, for coming into my life.